hello good morning to you uh, i would begin my presentation by uh, expressing my gratitude to some very important people without whom uh, this conference would not have happened uh, i would begin with professor cha uh, professor cha i met him in 2004 and before 2004 we uh, talked to each other for maybe a year it took me maybe a year to find him because i had uh, a job to do i belonged to um, a jesuit organization from the university of toronto it's a it's a uh, an academic organization and uh, they wanted to have a conference on alternate reality and meaning in india and uh, i was given that task and uh, i had to find a person who would convene the conference so it took me almost a year to find professor cha and uh, when i talked to him about the theme of the conference he had once agreed and he took a bang up job of arranging it at the university of pune uh, it was almost it was a three day a four day conference and beautiful beautiful work and ever since then we connected with each other uh a next meeting happened to be in canada last year when uh, he presented uh at our conference in uh, canada we have a conference every year on education to globalize the human mind uh, and professor cha gave the vedic point of view of what kind of education is needed to uh, raise people from limited identities to global human identity uh, so that was a great presentation our relationship uh, became even stronger and uh, on leaving canada professor tha suggested that we should have a similar conference in india and this work being relevant to india india being such a diverse country and integration of diversity is uh, absolutely needed in india for india to progress uh, otherwise we would not be achieving our full potential uh, so that this conference is the result of that conversation that we had professor jha came came to india and he talk to swami advayanand ji who had once agreed to the proposal of having the conference here so i'd like to thank you sir very much and i would also like to thank dr philip rana who is director of this organization for his tireless work that is needed to organize any conference he was up all night i'm sure people were coming through the night uh, to the center and he was there to welcome everybody make sure that there is food and there's bed and there is all kinds of comforts available for everyone so thank you dr rana and finally i'd like to thank the land of kerala uh, i'm really very pleased to be here kerala gave us some excellent excellent spiritual leaders of the world beginning with sankra of the advaita fame from christianity raimundu panikkar of cosmo theandrical unity fame he uh, raimundu panikkar was uh, responsible for taking the idea of advaita into christianity and then our own swami chinmayanand ji also comes from kerala and many more many more people of highly high spiritual caliber come from this land i would begin my uh, presentation with the centering process and that centering process is the deep breathing process this diagram that you see on the screen is uh, what we call normal breathing 
We breathe at the rate of about 15 pesos per minute. As the ball goes down, you can imagine you are out breathing. When the ball goes up, you are in breathing. So exhalation, inhalation, exhalation, inhalation. And this is what we do at the speed of 15 breaths per minute. I would request you to please follow that. Be aware of the speed of breathing when you're breathing at that rate. We only have about maybe three, minutes, uh, three seconds left. Uh, so please breathe at that rate to be aware of what the normal breath rate is. This is how we deep breathe. Normal breathing is autonomous. We are not aware of breathing. We may be doing other things. Breathing goes on automatically. And when the breathing is going on automatically, it is under the control of our emotions. And what we want to do is we want to bring our thinking brain into breathing process. And that is done when we deep breathe. And when we deep breathe, this is one of the postures which is considered to be very beneficial uh, in deep breathing. It's an efficient process. Um, we deep, deep breathe through the nose, mouth stays closed, eye stays closed, and we fill the lungs with the air. The upper diagram is in breathing. And see the lungs have expanded. When the lungs expand, the stomach contents are pushed up and downward. And when we outbreathe, the uh, Lung shrink, the lower diagram is when you're breathing out, lung shrink, and the diaphragm is pulled up and the stomach moves downward. So, this is the process we'll be doing, but we'll be doing it sitting up uh, in this posture. So, uh, if you don't mind, if you sit up on the front part of the chair with your feet planted firmly on the ground and uh, with your back straight, and pelvis slightly tilted forward. And this is a posture, is, is, is this kind of posture is needed to, uh, to maximize lung capacity. Essentially, it's a physical, physiological need to maximize lung capacity. And we start to deep breathe. Um, and as the ball goes up, Inhale, and as the ball goes down, exhale. It's a little jumpy. Uh, movement is not very smooth in this uh, presentation, but uh, please bear with me. Because it's happening. It's The idea was that I have you breathe in that, in that rhythm uh, and the rhythm, that part doesn't seem to be working because of some malfunction somewhere. Uh, so, um, if you breathe at the rate of say, breathe in for six seconds, breathe out for six seconds, roughly, you can count inwardly. When six seconds are over, one, two, three, four, five, six, that's six seconds. So if you close your eyes and sit up straight with your back straight and uh, mouth closed, breathe in for six seconds, breathe out for six seconds. And we do that for a few minutes. Uh, don't have to look at that diagram anymore. So let's do that for a couple of minutes, please. It helps us center our attention on the subject at hand. Before I proceed with my presentation, I'd like to introduce a colleague of mine. Professor Dubey is here, if you don't mind, uh, Professor Dubey. Um, he is, uh, um, as I was one of the founding directors of Shen, and he is another founding director of Shen that's present today. So I, I wanted you to meet him. Um, in my presentation is uh, um, 
essentially sharing the work that we are doing in, in Canada. Uh, I'm here to learn from you. you. This is the land of the gurus and the land of the great teachers. Um, I'm not a spiritual teacher by any stretch of imagination. I'm essentially a carpenter by trade. I've been making a living by putting bricks on bricks and um, engineering. That's what I've been doing. And uh, spirituality is uh, something that I had no training in. It's just a passion. It's a passion that grew out of a need. And uh, in 2000, yeah, 2000, we uh, organized a, um, an organization called Spiritual Heritage Education Network. And the diagram there you see in the middle, that's our, our uh, goal. Our goal is to teach or develop education, promote, develop, deliver, uh, and research education that is uh, inclusive of the whole globe. Uh, we will not teach anything that is not meaningful to everyone. That's our, uh, our condition that we impose on ourselves. Whatever we teach has to be meaningful and inclusive of everybody, not only every human being, but every existent beings in the world. So that is what we are for, and uh, this is, these pictures are from my early childhood experience. That's when I can say the real seed of this organization was planted in 1947. I was 10 years of age. And some of the pictures there are 1947 pictures. Um, the picture here uh, on the left, right, uh, trains of refugees coming and going back and forth from one side of the country to the other side and the uh, refugee camps upstairs over there and the picture in the middle um, showing essentially man's inhumanity to man based upon godly compassionate or uh, it didn't quite make sense in my mind and the other pictures, the pictures of the atom bomb and all the, the Nazis uh, being cruel to the, um, the Jews in, in, in Germany, those pictures are of the same era, essentially, 40s and 50s. Um, so, uh, I used to go walking with my father early in the morning and uh, we used to discuss things of social interest, and spiritual interest, and uh, he could not explain to my satisfaction why, in the name of religion, we kill each other. And that problem stayed with me all my life, essentially. And I was looking for answers. Then, a wise man appeared. We didn't go looking for him, he actually came looking for us, you can say, in a way. And we owe him a great debt of gratitude for the founding principle of Shen. When I asked him this question, I told him, look, you know, you are a spiritual teacher, you are a religious teacher, I'm not interested in learning from you unless you tell me the answer for this question. And once he told me the answer, I was satisfied, then he got my total attention, my total surrender. Uh, the light of spirituality dispels the darkness of division. That's what he said. And I held on to that line ever since. And uh, this happened in the late 70s. Uh, and uh, in middle 90s, I retired. I took early retirement to work on that idea, to promote, develop that idea. And uh, about um, spiritual teaching, and he is the person that I'm referring to. Uh, he is uh, late Swami Vishwatma Bhavaraji of the Brahmarshi Mission. He has an ashram near uh, Chandigarh. Uh, he's the one who put me on to what I'm doing today. And uh, 
school of education. Those who can read Sanskrit, Akhand Mandala Karam Vyaptam Yen Characharam Tatpadam Darshitam Yen Tasmai Shri Guru Vainama. What this uh, verse is doing is, in a way, describing an ideal teacher. Who is an ideal teacher? And in doing so, this verse also lays down the goal of education. And translated, this verse reads, I bow to the teacher who conclusively shows that which pervades the indivisible universe of the animate and the inanimate, connecting them all. That is the ideal teacher who shows conclusively that, that of which that is the symbol on the screen there. And there are various ways of referring to that uh, we will see later on, because that has got no name, it has got no trace, it has got, it's beyond language, it's got no form, so how do you refer to it? That is a problem, but that is the answer. Along with the answer comes a problem, but that's what education is for. Education does not move away from problems. If education cannot confront the problems, then it is not being responsible. The great question of feeling and meaning underlying human relations. Mommy, where did I come from? Every child asks that question. I say, it's not, a, it's not a trivial question, very important question. The answer to that question decides how that person is going to behave throughout his life. Without a meaningful, believable story that explains the world we actually live in, people have no idea how to think about the big picture. And without the big picture, we are all very small people. And a lot of us are very small people in this day and age because we do not have the big picture. We do not have any awareness of that. There are various ways of answering that question, but one dealing with the causal emergence of the universe from its underlying ultimate reality is the most profound. It satisfies the intellect, satisfying human head, it satisfies the human heart, and also satisfies the hands. Hands should be involved in serving of humanity, serving of the, um, of the world that that creates. I will spend some time on looking at the metaphysical principle of existence and uh, this principle of ultimate reality comes to us from spiritual seekers of all traditions. Shankara, Ibn Arabi, Sheikh Akbar, Ibn Arabi. Sheikh Akbar means the great Sheikh. Uh, Rumi, Meister Eckert, Ramana Maharishi, Raimundo Panikar, many others. And uh, according to Shankara, in the book written by Shah Kazmi, I do not know Sanskrit that well, so I cannot go back to the originals, but maybe Professor Jha can, can find the original citing to, to this sentence. And According to Shankara, all this word consists of a hierarchy of more and more subtle and comprehensive effects, which stands as the material cause, causes of whatever is grosser. And knowledge of this hierarchy leads to the notion of being as its support. So this is Shankara's quotation. Uh, and uh, I took it from the book written by Shah Reza Kazmi. Uh, he's a um, the Iranian scholar. He works out of uh, the UK. He wrote a book called Path to Transcendence. 
a path to transcendence, he studies three spiritual greats of the world, Shankara, Ibn Arabi, and Maishra Eckhart. Maishra Eckhart from Christianity, Shankara from Hinduism, and, uh, and Ibn Arabi from uh, Islam. And his definite conclusion is that no matter which tradition you come from, once you reach the pinnacle of spiritual understanding, it is the same. There is no difference. No dialogue necessary because there is no difference. And at the level of the dialogues, we can keep on dialoguing without coming to any conclusion because faith is something that we cannot dialogue in. Articles of faith are inviolable. They cannot be compromised. All religions teach that. So, in my view, I would like to work in the area of core spirituality of humanity rather than interfaith dialogue. Uh, interfaith dialogue is necessary, it's a step in the right direction, but it is not the end goal because, in my view, interfaith dialogue does not cut it. What cuts it is the core spirituality of humanity where no dialoguing is necessary. We are all in agreement with each other. And that is the area where we work in. Um, as far as metaphysics is concerned, I like to draw pictures. Uh, that this is a long train, and I look at it metaphorically. Um, the cars of the train representing causal succession underlying the object rep represented by the engine. The locomotive in front is the object. And the car behind it is the immediate cause of that object. And the car behind that is the immediate cause of the first cause. The cause behind that is the immediate cause of the second cause. Like that, there's unending causal succession. This is another train, uh, winding, long, long train, winding its way. Uh, up in the front is object O, immediate cause C1 of object O is the first car behind the engine. Second car behind the engine is the second cause of object O. Third car of this train behind the engine is C3, cause 3 of object O. And like that. There is nth cause of object O. And that n can be anything from 1 to a very large number. And let's look at the relationship of causal principle with an object. Causal principle of an object is subtler than the object. That is understood in science as well as in philosophy. Whatever is subtle, that controls whatever is gross. Um, the cause controls the, uh, uh, the, the behavior of the, of the gross. Uh, if an object obvious to senses is allocated degree of concreteness equal to one, a degree of concreteness, you can also say degree of knowability. I we can see that object um, is, is fully knowable um, with our senses. If we uh, allocate a degree of concreteness of one to an object which is obvious to our senses, then, then its cause will have a degree of concreteness of less than one. Okay? So, in this slide, if degree of concreteness of object O is one, then the degree of concreteness of its immediate cause, C1, would be 1 over R1, where R1 is larger than 1. Okay? People, uh, I'm getting into this kind of logic because I'm a mathematician, I'm an engineer, I cannot stay away from it. Um, anything larger than 1, if you divide by 1 by that, the answer would be less than 1. If I take one and divide by three, the object is a third, but the answer is a third. So, R1 is 
larger than 1. So the degree of concreteness of immediate cause C1 would be 1 divided by R1. Degree of concreteness of second cause would even be less than that. So we take 1 over R1 and divide it by another number which is larger than 1. Okay. So the answer would be even less than 1 over R1. So, so on it goes, the degree of concreteness of third cause would be 1 divided by R1 times R2 times R3, all the R's being less, more than 1. So, like that it goes. So, the degree of concreteness of the nth cause, for example, then would be 1 divided by the product of R1, R2, R3, so on until Rn. Okay. N can go to a hundred, a thousand, ten thousand, a million. Mathematically, it's possible for N to go to infinity. When N approaches infinity, then we are talking of the ultimate reality. Inf infinite regression from the object to the final cause, the ultimate cause. So that symbol that goes like this, looks like an 8 lying down, that is the symbol for infinity. Uh, so, if you look at 1 divided by the product of R1, R2, R3, Rn, n being infinity, what would be the answer of that? Zero. That means that final cause will not be visible at all it will not be sense perceptible at all. So all existence comes from non-existence. Paradoxical, but that's what mathematics tells us. Unless we are making a mistake in the, in the assumption. And I don't think we only made one assumption that the cause is subtler than the effect. I don't think that assumption is wrong. So, it can be mathematically proven that the ultimate cause exists, but we cannot know anything about it. Okay. Without that, nothing can exist. Infinite regression to ultimate reality, according to previous logic, the ultimate cause of any object in the universe, or the whole universe itself, is the reality which is infinitely subtle. Therefore, not sense percept perceptible, it's unmanifest. Manifestation comes from the unmanifest. The conclusion of science in its domain is the same. Science tells us matter comes from energy, and there's no similarity of energy and matter. Matter is something that we can touch, we can feel, we can see. Energy is something that we cannot touch, see, or feel, or define. You go to any physicist or any scientist ask what energy means, there is no definition that is independent. Just like there is no definition, independent definition of the ultimate reality. We can say we are all from ultimate reality. We can define ultimate reality in terms of its products. We can define energy in terms of its products. Let's look at what is the causal knowability of anything. If you look at the uh, uh, mystery or determinism of any object, according to this theory, nothing is totally deterministic. We cannot know anything in its totality of cause and effect. That doesn't mean cause and effect do not exist. It, they exist at a certain level. And then finally, cause and effect breaks down. Once you go to very subtle principles, cause and effect breaks down. Our spiritual scientists have been saying that from a very long time. You can get over your uh, karma. You can get over your karma. with spiritual lives. And you 
and there is, there is hope. We are not caught in a web of cause and effect because cause and effect only applies in a certain domain. We can go beyond that domain, there's no cause and effect. Or cause and effect, effect are not very well related with each other. Of all the objects in the, in, in the universe, human being is the most mystical, at least deterministic. And inanimate matter is the least mystical and most deterministic. Finite regression to deemed ultimate reality, many people can't imagine or accept an infinite regression to the ultimate cause. Especially in the West, there's been a problem of accepting infinity. At one time, they had a problem in uh, accepting zero. And uh, accepting infinity, their mind cannot stretch to it. Uh, and that has been a big, big problem. Huge problem. Uh, because it's paradoxical. They cannot deal with paradoxes. And when you come to spirituality, you have to be able to deal with paradoxes. There is no fixed cause and effect relationship that applies. Many people can't imagine or accept infinite regression to the ultimate cause. This is akin to taking the last visible car of the train as its last car. They say, oh, I can see that car. That is, has got to be the last car. So it depends upon where you're standing. For me, last car may be car number 100. For somebody else, maybe car number 50. For somebody else, maybe car number 120. And then, then we get together and we start fighting about which car is the last car. And that is the situation of the world these days. We are not looking at the ultimate cause. We are looking at what we presume is the ultimate cause. Because the ultimate cause we cannot look at, uh, look at, we cannot talk about. We can talk about the car we see. We can say, this car is of this color and this long and so many people can sit in it and so on and so forth. Okay, taking the last car as the ultimate car leads to a particular perspective with forms and or attributes. Different cultures have different perspectives. This is the position of popular faith based upon religion around the world. We all claim that there's one ultimate reality. We fight about whose perspective is the real one because we all have our different perspectives. Our irreconcilable perspectives lead to human fragmentation. That's what we are in a state of bad human fragmentation these days. And I don't think the life was a, a lot better 100, 200, 300 years ago. It, it has always been because we are in a tight grip of faith-based thinking. Faith is something that is not uh, conciliable or reconciliable. Uh, it is in, not negotiable. This conference on education about the one ultimate reality that is the core of all wisdom traditions. People refer to it as the absolute Brahman, Al-Haq in Islam, Ein Sof in uh, Judaism, Godhead in Christianity, Tao in, in, you know, in, the, in, the, in, the, in Taoism, Chi, Shunyata in Buddhism, nothingness, different ways of referring to it, but they're all referring to the same thing. Being an engineer, I like drawing diagrams. Coming to this diagram, on the right hand side we have the, the absolute ultimate reality, which is not visible at all. On the right hand side, on the left hand side, we have an object. Uh, could be me, could be universe. And what Shankara is saying, what that's uh, the um, metaphysics that we just looked at is saying that there is a progression 
from the uh, from the infinitely subtle up absolute ultimate reality to the object that we can perceive. There's the progression. Or if you go the other way around, um, from the object to the ultimate reality, there's a regression. Uh, and that regression and progression, these are successive. All being consists of an in infinity of successively concrete principles beginning with the absolute, with no concreteness whatsoever. We look at the word and all that exists, that's our situation. Where does diversity come from? It depends upon how, what is the uh, configuration of progression or regression. Uh, the top left hand side you see a tree and the uh, bottom right hand side you see a human being. Different configurations of progression from ultimate reality, a comb car to the object in the world. So whatever there is, is from that same uh, ultimate reality. And therefore, it is the same. There is no difference. What uh, Raimundo Panikkar called cosmotheendrical unity. The unity of the cosmos, divinity, and humanity. Jeev, Jagat, and Ishwar. Here you see that configuration is not fixed in time, it is dynamic. We are not the same, we were not the same yesterday as we are now, and we will not be the same tomorrow. So the configuration is changing, you can see the lines vibrating. So if we look at an animate being and an inanimate being, human being, the difference there is the configuration on the various dimensions. I is there a uh, dimension M. That is when we start seeing our mind. M is the lowest degree of subtlety of mind, uh, our inner body, you can say, that is visible to us. Uh, okay. Below M, we do not know anything about. It's total mystery to us. We know our mind, we do not go know beyond mind. But there is a lot beyond mind. When we're talking of self-realization, we're talking of realization of the part that we do not know anything about. We are bodies, we have to be we have to realize the body, we have to realize the mind, then we have to realize what is beyond mind. That is essential for us. Without that, we cannot exist. So, uh, in the human being, uh, the subtle body, that is the, called the mind, uh, in Christianity, that is called the heaven. Body is the earth. In the beginning, God created heaven and earth. Okay, heaven is the first thing that was created, the mind, and from the mind, the body, the earth. Uh, so, uh, in the inanimate being, you see the mind and the body, uh, the body is the, the biggest, you see, part is the body. Okay, the mind part is very, very tiny. And the mystery part is even tinier. And in the animate being, in an animal, for example, mind is a little more pronounced, and the human being is the most pronounced. And it's also the, 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 the mystery beyond the mind is also much more pronounced in the human being. And uh, in, in other beings, they're not pronounced at all. 
So if you look from the uh, point of view of the, 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 the world, you know, this thing may look like a, a, a thing, and this person may look like an animal, and this thing may look like a human being, but from the perspective of the, the reality, from the pers perspective of the uh, ultimate reality, uh, this, uh, sorry, uh, see that pointer here, these three symbols, they, they look the same. From the perspective of the ultimate reality, there is no difference between an animal or a human being or a piece of rock. For us, there is a big difference from the point of view of um, uh, human behavior. Okay. So what we have to learn is to tone down the human behavior, bring some perspective of ultimacy in it. The more the perspective of ultimacy we bring in, the more equality we see, the more spiritually developed we are. Not how many times I go to the church or how many times I go to the temple a day. Uh, I don't think it matters a hill of beans to tell you the truth. I may be offending some people, but pardon me, but that's the way I am. Ocean is ocean as it was in eternity. Contingent being, but its waves and currents. Do not let the ripples and mists of the world veil you from him who takes form within these whales. We are all whales. And be aware of the one that takes form within these whales. That is spirituality. Science. Look at the periodic table. People who have taken chemistry would, uh, would understand that infinite diversity in the material world can be traced down to almost a handful of elements on the periodic table. And atoms of all those elements are comprised of the same subatomic particles, electrons, protons, neutrons, held together with energy. So we are particulate beings held together by that ultimate reality. That is what science teaches us. And uh, religion is at loggerheads with science. But science is the biggest teacher we have at this, this time as far as spirituality is concerned. Science looks at the truth. So does spirituality. The aim of spiritual studies in science is no difference. The reason we have this confusion these days is because we have confused spirituality with faith. Spirituality is not faith. Spirituality is totally 100% logical. And you can experiment with it and you can come up with the same answers. Different people experimenting with it can come up with the same answers. So, it is more of a science than faith. If you look at the, the condition of science and spirituality, uh, in those diagrams you see the configuration of matter and you see the configuration of the universe. The universe uh, emerges from the ultimate reality, the absolute, which is much more comprehensive than energy, which, uh, the domain of which is only Matter. Matter is inanimate. So, energy is to the left of the absolute uh, because it's not as comprehensive as the absolute is. Let's come back to down to earth here. We are looking at um, physi neurophysiology. We look at the functioning of the human brain. We have sensory signals. I think I got 15 more minutes. Is somebody keeping time? Because I get carried away. Somebody keeping time? 
According to my calculation, I got 15 more minutes. If I'm wrong, please tell me. Uh, this is the human brain. And the way it functions is the, the sensory signals go to the thalamus. Thalamus is an area that acts as the receiving area. Um, what is called in, in, in uh, uh, industrial terminology, shipping and receiving. Uh, actually, it's not shipping area, it's just the receiving area. It receives the sensory signals from the eyes, from the ears, from the skin. Um, and the thalamus is connected to the amygdala with a very fast connection. The connection between the, uh, the thalamus and the amygdala is over one neuron, one neuron. Very fast connection. Amygdala is the center of emotion. It knows our fears, our likes and our dislikes, our raga, dvesha, abhinavesha and all those things. And when the signal is received by the amygdala, it at once acts on it. There is the motor signals going from the amygdala to the rest of the body to act on. On the other side, we have the neocortex. Neocortex is the thinking part of the brain. And the connection between the thalamus and the neocortex is a very slow connection. Many neurons. So the signal, as it travels from one neuron to the other neuron, it has to jump a, a gap. And that's a slow process. The thinking part of the brain does not even know what we had done. We've already done it. Then we say, oh, what the hell did I do? That's what happens in our lives. We do not know what we are doing because we are configured that way. Physiology is that way. That is the current neurology. And according to the current neurology, brain is a plastic thing. You can mold it. You can mold it under our control. We can slow down the action of the amygdala so that the neocortex, the thinking part of the brain, has got a chance to advise us as to what our behavior should be. So, under normal circumstances, our thinking part of the brain gets hijacked by amygdala. Amygdala is like a, uh, you know, very quick acting part of the brain, based upon our emotions, our likes, dislikes, our raga, dvesha, vinavesha, asmita, you know, that's what that is based upon and those things have been drilled into us over uh, with biological succession from uh, the time the word began. So, uh, our thought process is unused And we have to learn how to change the way our mind, our brain works. And it's a simple process. The process I took you through, it didn't work very well because of technological problems. That process itself can change the way these two things cooperate with each other, the amygdala and the neocortex. And we have been working in this area for a number of years. Uh, we've been teaching deep breathing locally in our, uh, in our city uh, at the hospital uh, to people who are addicted to alcohol and other substances. We've been able to cure people of lifetimes of addiction and not talking about what they're addicted to at all. We are not talking about dangers of alcoholism. All we are doing is teaching deep breathing. That's it. The rest of it, they figure out. The question is that as soon as they see a bottle, a big like kicks in, reaches for it, down goes. There's no hope in, uh, for that person ever. He's caught in that vicious cycle. And what we are doing is we are slowing down the the rate at which the amygdala acts and 
thinking part of the brain gets a chance and that changes their lives. We do not, we do not preach. That's one thing we have taken on ourselves not to do. We are educators, not preachers. So uh, that's a restriction that we have put on ourselves. So putting it all together, the uh, upper diagram is uh, the continuous progression from the ultimate uh, reality, the absolute on the right hand side, to a human being on the left hand side, and the various compartments, the body on the leftmost side, and then the sensory faculty, and then the ego, and then the intellect, and then what is the total mystery? Okay, and if you look at the uh, wisdom traditions of the world, the, uh, the part closest to the left is the body, uh, and then the sensory faculty, and then ego, then intellect. And, and that nomenclature is uh, essentially, we took based upon what we found from various traditions. For example, Sufi tradition from Islam, uh, Sankhya tradition from and uh, uh, from uh, Hinduism and uh, Meister Eckert's, Meister Eckert's exegesis on, uh, um, on, on Genesis from the Bible. Uh, we put it all together in a, in a secular way. And this is also what psychology is talking about. But psychology removes that spiritual mystery. Psychology does not go to the absolute reality. Psychology does talk about the body and the id and the ego. Psychology does not even go to the intellect. Because psychology was developed by Sigmund Freud. He was a, he was a psychotherapist. And in any healing process, if the results are within 90%, they're good results. If you can heal 90% of the people, you're doing very well. So he didn't even bother about the fact that there is intellect that can overpower um, your ego. So, so you, you have uh, the, uh, the, the uh, continuous model at the top, then the discrete model of various um, wisdom traditions put in, you know, uh, secular uh, words, and, and then Last of all, we got the modern neurophysiological terms. Uh, nerves, the nervous system is essentially nerves in uh, physiology. And uh, amygdala is the center of emotion, that is ego, manas. And uh, neocortex is the cerebral center. And I, there's more and more recognition of the eye, which can choose what to use. Whether to go along with the neocortex, or to go along with the amygdala, or to give neocortex a chance. So there is something beyond the amygdala, the emotional me, and the thinking me that decides what is going to rule at any one time. Here, what I've tried to show, uh, you know, going back to deep breathing, trying to relate deep breathing with the psychology. Uh, are, there are two, two, two diagrams on the left hand side. Um, what, one says phy physiology, and uh, uh, that physiology part, the upper diagram shows breathing in, breathing out. That is an autonomic process, and then breathing in, breathing out, and thought intervening. Make sure we think while we breathe in, we take in as much air as we can. And we think as we breathe out, we expel as much air as we can. Um, and on the right hand side, life psychologically is nothing but uh, stimulus and response. We see things, we touch things, we hear things, and we respond to it. That's life. Series of stimulus responses. 
cycles. And most of the time that stimulus response cycle is run by the amygdala without thinking. That is automatic behavior, similar to automatic breathing. Okay, and then spiritual life is when we give our thinking part a chance to decide the behavior. Okay, so we should really be uh, living that kind of life. When we see a stimulus, we think about it and we make sure that what we see is actually the object that's outside and then we think about how we should react to it, how we should behave. So, we can look after the psychological part if we can look after the physiological part. That's what we're trying to say here, that we deep breathe, we breathe consciously with our own volition, we can learn to behave thoughtfully. So this is a, a, a practical way of being spiritual. Here we're trying to, uh, to show um, what happens. Uh, the, uh, the two diagrams that I'm showing here is a is this is fine. Okay, this, this one, these two, this is inner me and outer diagram, outer configuration is the universe. This is me in the universe. If my eye is here on the surface, okay, all I'm going to see is, the, is division. And what we have to do is move inwards. The more we move inwards, the more inclusiveness we see. We move inward a little more, we see more inclusiveness. And we see inward a, a little more, we see more inclusiveness. This is an animation showing the power of going inward. If we go inward, what happens to us? We can see oneness more and more until, until we get there, then the whole Brahmanda is one. And that is how we start behaving. And uh, this is the last slide, and I think I've gone two minutes past the time. Um, Wisdom-based critical thinking is the bedrock of course spirituality. So I want, what we're suggesting is that we try to ensure that we do not confuse faith with spirituality. Spirituality is a science, we start treating it as a science. And then people will pay attention. Once we speak with the same language, People will pay attention when the, when the thinking people of Hinduism, thinking people of Christianity, thinking people of Islam, they talk the same language, they go to the government, we want this kind of education in our schools and colleges. I don't think any political person would have a chance. And that is what our main point is. Thank you very much.